here we have some artwork as well as a picture of Viktor Shlosky. Uh, Olga Rosanova was a Russian futurist painter. So what I'll show you is that the movement of Russian futurism is entangled with the movement of Russian formalism. And this is where a lot of the inspiration for making strange comes from, because there is a lot of making strange in Russian futurism. And these the Russian futurism and uh, Viktor Shlosky and the movement he is known to be part of, which we call Russian formalism, they are uh, happening at the same time and they are kind of intertwined with one another. So I'll this is what I'm going to talk to you about. So going back to what I, how I introduced this to you last week, we were talking about the different ways this word in Russian originally, Ostranenia, um, how this is translated, and it's translated as defamiliarization, estrangement, making strange, or estrangement. And um, there are a lot of ways that we can think about this. Uh, one of the ways that we can think about it is in terms of cinema. And it's the time at this point in the early 20th century, it's the time of early cinema. It's a really exciting time for cinema. And um, there's this Russian filmmaker, Zygo Vertov, and he experiments uh, with the things you can do with the camera. And there's this famous film, maybe one or two of you have seen this, Man with a Movie Camera. So he's making documentaries at this time. And he is playing around with um, a way of filming with the camera rotated slightly so that everything is made a little bit strange because the dimensions don't look quite right. The angles don't look quite right. So this is an example, a really um, clear visual example of defamiliarization. And it's happening round about the same time. So this is a good way, a good thing to keep in your mind as um, an initial uh, example of defamiliarization happening at the time and the place when it was invented. So that's um, how it might be seen uh, cinematically. So if we're thinking about that um, shot of the camera being moved sideways, let's now think about how that could be uh, described in, an, in a similar linked way, still about movement. Um, this is Viktor Shlosky, our guy, from another of his books called Night's Move. There, this is the quotation. He says, the night is not free. It, moved in, it moves in an L-shaped manner because it is forbidden to take the straight road. Now, without going into a lot of detail about why he's talking about um, the knight as the figure in a chess game, um, being forbidden to take the straight road, because this would involve a lot of discussion about the political situation. And um, it was the, just before the, this was just after the Russian revolution and um, Shlosky was in a very difficult position um, in terms of the shifting political landscape um, and in terms of the, the theories he was writing. So he couldn't express himself directly in his writing because of the political situation. And this is what he means when he says the knight moves, uh, is forbidden to take the straight road. So this is, if you know the game of chess, um, the knight doesn't move in a straight line. The knight moves in the shape of an L. So this is very interesting for us in terms of making strange because it seems to be then about moving in an unexpected way, moving somehow sideways as well as forwards or backwards. Um, in any case, it's not the straight path. So this, as well as the shifting camera um, view, these are some examples, some visual examples of how the concept emerged. Okay, so I mentioned Russian futurism. 
So this movement, maybe you know about futurism as one of the many avant-garde movements um, which emerged at the beginning of the 20th century across Europe. Um, and futurism is generally understood or known about in the Italian context. Um, Italian futurism was much more well known. Um, it was a much bigger movement and um, we have figures uh, like Marinetti, who was the kind of leader of the Italian futurist movement. Um, but at the same time, there was the futurist movement was happening in Russia um, and it was quite different. Um, and this also shows examples of making strange because what they did with the with language and with painting, um, with performance, with theater, all of these show examples of defamiliarization, even at the level of how their texts were published. As you can see in this example, um, and this, uh, this text was called World Backwards, which again shows you something there's a, there's a degree of making strange, even in that title, world backwards. So it's not as you would imagine it to be, um, but they're often printed on old paper. Sometimes they were printed, these texts were printed on old wallpaper um, and quite primitive in terms of the style. Um, so, and quite striking as well. So this is, this is a little bit of Russian futurism. And then there is also here this word Zaum, which is a word they made up, the Russian futurists. Um, and there you have the, uh, both the Russian, um, the Russian word, and then it's uh, transliteration in English, and then the description of what this word means. So Zaum means beyond the mind or trans sense. Um, and this was the kind of language which the, some of the Russian futurists made up. They were trying to invent a new language. So it's quite revolutionary and exciting in a lot of ways, but it also involves defamiliarization um, and making strange. The other word which I have put there for you to see is shift, or in the Russian, stvig. Um, this is also really important because um, defamiliarization or what we're thinking about is, a sh is about a shift in perception. I was talking about that last week, um, a shift in perception. So both of these terms, zaum and shift, these are really useful for us to think about in terms of understanding where this strategy or device of making strange comes from. Um, so here uh, we have, uh, this is another text um, which the Russian futurists uh, wrote and published and they published it on um, you can see the material is almost, it's like a sacking material, like some kind of cloth. Um, this was the manifesto of the Russian futurists, and it was called a slap in the face of public taste. So it's quite aggressive in its, um, in its tone, let's say. And um, the, one of the lines from their manifesto we alone are the face of our time. The horn of time blows through us in the art of words. The past constricts. So you can see from there how they're talking about time. They describe themselves as futurists. So they're clearly very forward looking in what they want. Um, and yet at the same time, um, the whole time is blowing through them in the art of words. So that's an interesting way of thinking about it, an interesting metaphorical way of thinking about it. Um, the past constricts, so they're not so interested in the past, they're looking forward. Some examples of uh, 
artwork which came out at this time. Maybe this looks a bit more familiar to you in if you've seen futurist paintings um, in galleries, museums, this kind of abstract uh, geometric forms, um, disjunction of forms, even that is the title of Rosanova's um, painting there. Um, so this is Russian futurist painting. And you can see that the making strange is happening here as well. Some more ex visual examples. Um, Goncharova, another Russian futurist painter, um, and she painted the some of the front covers or illustrations for some of the futurist texts, such as this one, um, and also a more kind of classically futurist looking painting, although it's more, it's less geometric and a bit more natural, I would say, than some of the Italian futurist examples we could think of. Okay. Um, this is a little uh, hint at where we will go next week, um, because linking up the formalism, the futurism, and then even thinking about linguistics is this that guy, Roman Jakobsen. And he is, uh, we will read a text from him um, for next week. Um, he uh, had a very long career, but he started off as a young man um, hanging out with the Russian futurists and writing manifestos. And he, he had a, um, another name that he used to sign um, when he was writing these more radical texts. And then later on, this book came out called My Futurist Years, because he became an extremely uh, influential linguist, Roman Jakobsen. Um, but we will talk about him next week. Uh, this is just to show that there's another, another figure who is important, I would say. Okay, another text from Shlovsky, very similar in its message to the um, art as device, which we will talk about a bit later. Um, here he says, the writers of past times wrote too smoothly, too sweetly. Their things were reminiscent of that polished surface of which Korolenko spoke. Across it runs the plane of thought touching nothing. The creation of a new tight language is necessary, directed at seeing and not at recognition. So we will talk about this opposition of seeing and recognition, because these are different ways of perceiving things. Um, he's all, Shlovsky is always pointing us to seeing rather than recognition. Seeing is a creative act. Recognition is a kind of automatic uncreative act, but we'll come back to that. He also says, um, the history of art shows us that at least very often, the language of poetry is not a comprehensible language, but a semi-comprehensible one. Thus, savages often sing in archaic or alien tongue, sometimes so incomprehensible that the singer or more correctly, the lead singer must translate and explain to the choir and audience the meaning of the song he has just composed. So the idea of the language of poetry being semi-comprehensible, it's not a straight, uh, uh, a straight line of communication, something else is going on in poetic language, and this is the making strange. So this is thinking about it from the line of writing and text. We will come back to this when we're reading Art as Device later on, but this is to give you some more from Schlossky. Okay, so I thought I would give you an example of poetry from this time, from a Russian futurist uh, writer um, quite a visionary figure, Velimir Kolebnikov. Um, and this is the kind of poetry which he was uh, inventing, which is playful and um, definitely uh, defamiliarized, I would say. And um, I mean, it's hard to describe. Maybe I will just 
show I've got some recordings here which I can play for you um, and you can see the text there the Russian text and one attempt at a translation it's almost nonsensical it's called incantation by laughter and if you if you kind of listen to these recordings it's I always think about this poem as performing uh, itself. It's a, a poem that laughs itself. It's laughing as it's being read out, if that makes sense. Um, okay, so let's see if I can play you. I will play you, um, maybe we'll come to the recording but that, that Roman Jakobsen himself was reading out. Well, we'll go with this one first, it's quite short. Okay, don't worry if you don't understand this, um, because now I will play you a different version where we hear uh, an English translation. Um, but it's just to get the sense of the rhythm. There's rhythm. There's uh, up and quite a musical intonation there in in Roman Jakobson's reading. But just listen to this one. Translation of the mm -hmm. English of this great uh, poem on its hundredth anniversary, Incantation by Laughter in English. Sounds great. Zaklete smiech, o rasvete smiechi. О, засмейте смехачи, что смеются смехами, что смеянствует смеяльно, о, засмейтесь усмеяльно, о, рассмешишь над смеяльных смех усмейных смехачей, о, и смейся рассмеяльно смех над смейных смехачей, смеева, смеева, усмей, осмей, смешики, смешики. Смеюнчики, смеюнчики, о, рассмейтесь, смехачи, о, засмейтесь, смехачи. So here's my, my translation of this poem. Incantation by laughter. We laugh with our laughter. Low laugher and loafer, slow laughter and laffer, lop laughter and loofer, loop slapper and lassler, pleat loper et lipler, bloop oofer and cooter, floop flaffer et fluber, full lickless and slicklers, act lushing, ag laughing, ook loofing, ip loopling, ook living, got sprickling, ook laughter, ook laughing, ook laughing, ook laughter. This is. Okay, um, so you can hear you can hear in this translation the feeling of the poem has been preserved, which is very playful, um, and there are lots of words which are somehow nonsensical words, but the but this general sense of laughing and kind of silliness is being uh, expressed there. Um, even more extreme, um, even more performative, I think, is this uh, example here. This is Velimir Klebnikov's incantation by laughter. La, la, laughlings. La, oof, love and lovelings, who laughing with laughter, who laughing largely, la, la, oof, love and lowly, la, la, loofish lovelings, laughing with the Lord, laughing 
La, la, laufenisch, lauflings, lache, lohlen, out laufli, laufen, laufen, lo, lo, lu, lu, hüpfen, lu, hüpfen, lo, fennen, gum, lo, fennen, gum, la, la, utlopen, lauflings, la, la, utlopen, lauflings. Okay, so I don't know, I can't, because um, the screen is shared and I can't see anyone's re uh, reaction to this, but for me, I find this quite funny. Um, and it's, it's hard not to laugh at this kind of uh, performance because it's, it's, it's really um, stretching what a language, what a word can do. Um, so this, this action of laughing um, this poem is laughing itself, I think, and this I think this is what Klebnikov wanted. Um, he just plays with one word and makes all these words around it. Um, and this is a really vivid example of making strange, I think. Okay. Um, so another text from Klebnikov, um, which where he's doing something quite different. He is playing around with what with the symbolism of letters and the shapes of letters um, and how we move poetically through the alphabet. So he says, we have heard of L. We know that it is the sudden halt of a falling point upon a broad transverse plane. We know about R. We know it is the point that penetrates, that cuts like a razor through the transverse plane. R rips and resonates, ravages boundaries, forms rivers and ravines. R in the hands of L. Imagine an eagle austerely unfurling its angling wings. So from this poem, Klebnikov is creating these stories um, about the letter L and the letter R. It's extremely playful again, and um, the, his imagination is really uh, traveling far there with the letters L and R. There are, there's much, he plays with lots of different letters in this poem called Sangizi. So now you're getting some more examples, textual examples of defamiliarization, which um, come from round about the time that Shlovsky made up the concept. So if you have questions, um, save them up and we can talk about this after. I'll just show you a couple more things. Um, I said I would come back to this idea of shift. Um, so Klebnikov and Alexei Krushenik, these were the two main fu Russian futurist guys. They uh, wrote um, a text called Shiftology of Russian Verse, an offensive and educational treatise. So this uh, text, played around with the idea of shift, saying transrational language is always a shift language. It contains fragments of shattered worlds. The shift conveys movement and space. The shift conveys multiplicity of meanings and images. The shift is the style of our contemporary life. It is impossible to teach all pos it is impossible to teach all possible artistic effects because the work of art is a live organism. However, shiftology brings them to the fore and gives us a new tool, a new way of reading, a new alphabet. So the fact that they have taken this word shift and turned it into a uh, shiftology. So somehow formalized this word shift into shiftology. Maybe we can think of shiftology as another kind of defamiliarization because they're all about different kinds of shifts, whether it's a geometric shift, a shift in space or a shift in time. Um, there are lots of different ways that we can think about how it is a shift. Okay, um, just to show you, this is, I wrote a book, I, my PhD was um, working on 
this area along with the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze. Um, and so uh, this is a book that came out a few years ago called Deleuze and Futurism, a manifesto for nonsense. So if you're interested in these kinds of things about language, inventing new languages, um, what nonsense might mean in a productive way, um, then you can check out that book. Okay, so these um, we these are just more things for you to think about that we will come back to when we discuss um, from this other text of Schlossky's Resurrection of the Word. He says, we do not sense the familiar. We do not see it, but recognize it. We do not see the walls of our rooms. It is so hard for us to spot a misprint in a proof, particularly if it is written in a language well known to us, because we cannot make ourselves see and read through and not recognize the familiar word. So here we get this um, distinction between seeing and recognition again. So when we recognize something, it's almost as if we don't see it. It's the same way that when you see something every day, you see yourself in the mirror every day, you really don't look in a very careful way at yourself in the mirror necessarily um, because you know what you look like. So you, it's, a see, it's a recognition that happens there. Um, so that's recognition for Schlotsky. Whereas seeing is a creative act that happens where you see something as if for the first time. So hopefully that distinction is clear to you now. He then also talks about it in Art as Device, where he says, after being perceived several times, objects acquire the status of recognition. An object appears before us. We know it's there, but we do not see it. And for that reason, we can say nothing about it. The removal of this object from the sphere of automatized perception is accomplished in art by a variety of means. So again, what, what he's interested in, in terms of defamiliarization is the removal of an object from the sphere of automatized perception. If it's automatized, it happens without us really consciously knowing. So hopefully that's um, more clear for you now. And then I will just finish with it, another hint to a future um, session we'll do. And this is thinking about these ideas in terms of gender. Um, and this is obviously much, much more uh, recent. Um, Judith Butler, who is a, a gender theorist, talks here about categories of different categories of perceptions. And she says in her book, uh, in the preface in 1999 to her book, Gender Trouble, she says, what are the categories through which one sees? The moment in which one's staid and usual perceptions fail, when one cannot with surety read the body that one sees, is precisely the moment when one is no longer sure whether the body encountered is that of a man or a woman. So I will leave that with you to think about. We'll come, we have a whole session where we will talk about these ideas in terms of um, gender, um, but that's just to show you how we could use the original concept to think about a more uh, modern, concept or a more contemporary concept. Okay, I will stop sharing my